So, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming out. And before I get into any of this, which you guys know I love talking about, I want to first express my extreme gratitude to, uh, first of all, Claire Putman, um, who Journal Club would not be the same uh, without Claire. Uh, the amount of work she puts in behind the scenes, the amount of time uh, that she spends uh, is, you know, it's huge. And you know, we really could not do it without her and the rest of the Journal Club team. So give a round of applause. Um, uh, and I also got to thank especially Dr. Basilio and Mr. D who have helped me uh, through the past couple years in their classes and on IRT and working on Journal Club and the Pingree experience wouldn't have been the same without them. Uh, and also to my parents who have supported me through all of my endeavors and all of my reptilian endeavors. Uh, so let's get started. Um, of course, I got to give my plug for you know reptiles book on any time I start talking. Uh, I don't need you to walk away from this being in love with reptiles, but having a respect for them uh, would be amazing. Having respect for them as uh, amazing organisms or feats of biology. Um, you know, having respect to, if you see a turtle on the side of the road, help it cross, or if you're at the zoo, spend the extra couple minutes reading about, you know, the snakes and the lizards, um, just because you could find out things that you didn't think were possible uh, through these amazing animals. Um, fun fact, I am either in, right there, or it took all of these pictures. Uh, it's an American alligator, a water monitor, an alligator snapping turtle, and a sub-Saharan sand viper. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So, I want you guys to imagine a world that is only female. So, all the guys in this room are gone. Uh, so, that's what the world would be like if we were a species of whiptail lizards. That's scary for the, especially the, the dudes in this room. Um, <laughs> but, the two articles that I'm going to be using, the main one is, going to, is called Sister Chromosome Pairing Maintains Heterozygosity in Parthenogenetic Lizards. And the other one I will be referencing is Facultative Parthenogenesis Discovered in Wild Vertebrates. Which, the top one means how in all species, female species remains genetically diverse. Before we get into this, it's going to be essential for you guys to have a brief understanding of what meiosis is. So meiosis is the reason why you're a blend of your mom and your dad. Um, it, uh, it occurs when um, a sperm cell and an egg cell come together and it fertilizes. Uh, so if you look at this diagram, this is the, um, the DNA, or what we're going to call chromosomes, from a set of chromosomes from the male side and from the female side. So the stages in meiosis sort of go like this, and I also have a drawing up on the board. Um, the DNA replicates, it pairs together, it exchanges information, so they sort of mix together, and that's the, that's the blending part. That's why you look like a combination of your mom and your dad. They divide, and then they divide again. Um, it's kind of funny to think about that you guys all came from this. You, know, you all came from this cells. Uh, and without this process, you wouldn't be you. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So Parthenogenesis, what? We're talking about parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis is asexual reproduction in a species that would normally reproduce sexually. Um, and it's not something that's necessarily new. Uh, they've known that it's been going on for quite some time in species like hammerhead sharks, uh, Komodo dragons, Mr. D oh, not Mr. D. <laughs> um, and one, one that we're going to be talking about at length today are cottonmouth snakes. So I have a quick clip that I took last weekend. Oh my god. And yeah, I'm on, I'm on that end of that venomous snake. Um, and this is a specimen that's very special, and it's special because this is a, a specimen that lives at Zoo Atlanta, and it was reproduced without a dad. Uh, its mom was a wild-caught animal that they brought in, um, and about four years after they brought it into their collection, it miraculously had a baby. Um, so after that, the sort of the head of uh, herpetological research there 
uh, launched a project to figure out, uh, to sort of dive into this Department of Justice a little bit deeper. Um, and this is different from the whiptail lizard, and I want you guys to get an understanding of why the, the all-female species is so special. So this is just a, a very, um, a very basic uh, little diagram about parthenogenesis versus normal fertilization. So here, an egg is fertilized with sperm, and a baby is created with one set of chromosomes from the mom, one set of chromosomes from the dad. In parthenogenesis, you don't have the genetic information coming from the dad. So, uh, and it's not completely understood, but a basic uh, rendering of it would be you get the one set of chromosomes from the female, it doubles, and then, so this, that's what makes up the genetic information, is that one chromosome that doubles, and then meiosis occurs in a fashion that looks like this. So this is the one set of chromosomes, the females. It doubles, and then in normal meiosis, it would double again. Uh, it would divide and divide again. And if you look, so this is, this is normal meiosis below, where they would exchange information and they'd be combinations of each other. They're all the same. Okay, so although this sounds good, there are a lot of problems with this sort of parthenogenesis, and there's a hugely decreased survival rate because if you think about it, it's sort of like extreme. In yeah. What's up? Um, okay. So the point is, in the top diagram, yep. you have an egg being fertilized by sperm, right? Yes. And in the bottom diagram, you have an egg being fertilized by an egg. Exactly. Okay. So uh, here's my question: Sperm yep. move. Yep. Egg don't. Right. So there's no collision that, so are you asking how that starts? Yeah, I mean like the, the sperm will swim to an egg, right? right. And then it'll penetrate it. Um, an egg and an egg just kind of sit there. Exactly, so that's one of the things that they don't understand. It's, you know, this isn't an entirely understood uh, development, but somehow they're able to fertilize themselves. Um, and this can start from an impetus of, um, so let's say, this is, you know, this isn't confirmed, but this is, you know, a theory for why this, the model of this cottonmouth would have wanted to reproduce parthenogenically. So it was taken from the wild, it got isolated, and then it felt like, oh no, I'm isolated in this new habitat. I need a male to reproduce with so that I can repopulate. And so it reproduced and it came out with this male bait. So it could be a somehow that's turned on um, by a uh, uh, situation in need. And it's, it's not completely understood. Um, okay, so now let's look at a genotype of a um, animal that was reproduced in what's called thermal fusion, fusion automixis, and that's just the name for the type of parthenogenesis that we're, that we're first talking about. So, you. What do you see that's similar between the top line, which is the genotype for the mom, and the bottom line, which is the um, genotype for the, the baby? It's similar? Yeah, what do you see that's similar? So look at the numbers. Um, I mean, like what about if it's similar? Just very simply, what do you see that's similar between these numbers on top and the ones on bottom, and it goes across the board? What's the same, what's the reoccurring pattern? No? Okay. So, um, so what happens is, you know how we were talking about how it takes only the one set of chromosomes? Yeah. That would be this. It takes it, and it that's what makes up both of uh, the, both of the chromosomes. So if you look across, there's no genetic diversity. Okay? So what they call this is it's called a half clone. They take half of the DNA and that's what it clones from. And there are problems in this in that, let's say the mom on one side of its DNA had uh, a genetic precursor that would expose it to some sort of birth defect um, on one side, which would normally uh, be compensated by male DNA, 
it won't be because it's going to be on both sides of um, of the chromosome, and um, so it exposes it to a much larger risk uh, of dying young and of uh, having a lot of problems. And I couldn't tell you why. I'd really love to be able to tell you. And through all my research, I couldn't figure out why. But it seems that all the animals that are reproduced this way come out to be male, which would be good if a female became isolated and then needed a male to repopulate. Um, but it isn't good for long-term maintenance. Um, Tom? Are all the numbers on the left in the same chromosome, all the numbers on the right in the same chromosome, on the sides of the slash? No. Um, so like here, you see how they're different numbers? Yeah. Um, that's on different. different. Yeah, but going across right. all different sets are yeah. like, so for on the top, like the 169 and the 231, are those the same chromosome and so on, the 215, the 232, and the 140, um, on the left side of the slash? Yeah, I, I, see, I see what you mean. Um, I don't think so. I think it's they, they look at different uh, each one of these are at different um, points, so I think that they, uh, I'm not sure how genotyping works, but um, I think it's all from different ones. Okay. All right, but let's talk about how this is different from the all-female society that I talked about earlier. So this is a whiptail lizard. <coughs> it's a, hold on. Nope. <laughs> 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 um, back to the presentation. Um, this is a whiptail lizard, and these are three different species. This one is the one that reproduces completely parthenogenically without any input from a male. And what's interesting is that there are these three species that live very close to one another, and somehow this one came to be that doesn't need a male. There are theories that it was hybridized between uh, these two species, and you know, if you if you look at it, it kind of looks like it, where it has the stripes from this one and the large size from that one. Um, but you know, they don't know how they've developed this mechanism that allows them to reproduce so much more efficiently than any other species, um, except for one other, which is called the blind snake, or it's a specific type of blind snake that can do the same thing, and they they currently populate six out of our seven continents. So it shows you the power that this advantage has. Um, but they've known that this has happened since about the 1960s, and they set out to figure out why, or how it could happen. Uh, Derek, what do you see? But, so these are close-up pictures of the fertilized egg cells of the sexually reproducing lizards and the asexually reproducing lizards. What do you see, Garrett? The bottom is bigger. Yeah, the bottom one has a lot more stuff. It, they actually have twice the volume of chromosomes. They have twice the amount of DNA. This is a um, graph to show you or to quantify that. They have twice the amount of DNA <coughs> as the sexually reproducing ones. So if we're going to go back to meiosis, let's think about what having they all, oh sorry, they also figured out that they were able to double uh, their DNA again before meiosis began. Uh, so they're going to have, so this is what it's going to look like going into meiosis. They start out with twice the amount of DNA an animal would have, like in this, where it only has one, they're able to have two sets of chromosomes. It doubles before meiosis begins. And then, so the normal thing to think is that it would then pair with the homologous or uh, the similar but different uh, set of chromosomes, exchange DNA, and then um, divide and divide again. But the researchers then thought that <clears throat> why would it multiply or why would it double before meiosis if it was just going to pair with homologous chromosomes and then exchange DNA? Why? Because if it would just if they had twice the amount of DNA going into meiosis, why would they, why wouldn't they just do what normal meiosis looks like? Why would they want to double? So they went back and they looked at chromosomes that have paired together um, in fertilized eggs. So this is a close-up picture of a fertilized egg and I know that you and I can't distinguish anything from this, but these are pairs 
of chromosomes. And